What is up, Rumble? What is up, YouTube? Welcome back to the Ryan Mattis Show. And boy, oh boy, are we going to have a night tonight. I didn't think we were going to have a night tonight. I didn't think there was much going on in the crypto space outside of uh, crypto market crash trending, which uh not really sure if a 5% pullback or 10% pullback is a crypto market crash, but it does look like altcoins are getting pretty wrecked right now. But so is the Ethereum team. Speaking of getting wrecked, I don't know if you guys seen the cover photo, but James O'Keefe has taken down the crypto mafia. So we're going to get into that here. I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to show up because I don't want to start playing it right away. Uh, let me just start off with some crypto comedy. We'll hang out for a second, shoot the shit, and then uh, we'll get into this uh, crypto mafia video. So this says, uh, the collector of sats, if you guys aren't ho at following, hoarding sats over on X, his work is absolutely phenomenal. He says, my wife listening to me work on my Bitcoin rant in the shower before we head out to dinner with her friends. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's the best crypto asset? Well, Bitcoin's the best crypto asset. Okay. What's the second best? There is no second best. There's no second best crypto asset. There's a crypto asset. It's called Bitcoin, right? Right? There's no second best, okay? But take all your money, buy Bitcoin. Then take all your time, figure out how to borrow more money to buy more Bitcoin. Then take all your time and figure out what you can sell to buy Bitcoin. And if you absolutely love the thing that you're that you don't want to sell it, Go mortgage your house and buy Bitcoin with it. And if you've got a business that you love because your family works for the business that's in your family for 37 years and you can't bear to sell it, mortgage it, finance it, and convert the proceeds into the hardest money on earth, which is Bitcoin. Which is Bitcoin, the hardest money on earth. That's awesome. <laughs> I feel like anybody that's in crypto, that's how we all are. Maybe, maybe not just about Bitcoin, but about anything. But uh, let's just get into this James O'Keefe video. So if you guys aren't following James O'Keefe over on X, uh, please do. Let me actually go grab the uh, tweet so we can give this man a shout out because uh, he deserves it. We've talked about, we tried to take down the crypto mafia. And I wonder if um, if there were some bigger donors in like the Bitcoin space that were like, hey, uh, hey, James. You know, uh, we'd like you to dig into some of these Ethereum founders and see exactly how crooked they are. I mean, the, the whole crypto space, as far as altcoins and all these shit coins, it's rotted to the core, folks. You guys, I tried to I tried to go after them one time and all my shit got hacked. My, tw my Twitter got hacked. They took over. They bypassed my 2FA. I lost my Instagram, got shut down. Yeah. These are some crooked dudes and they steal millions and millions from people. So let's see, where did, uh, let's see, James O'Keefe says, and he tweeted this out four hours. This is just part one. I'm not sure when part two is going to be coming out. So let me throw up his, uh, his, uh, username over here on the screen. We'll read this one out together. It's pretty wild. Pretty freaking wild. I want to see how many people he's going to take down in this one. So check this out. It says exposing crypto mafia part one, Ethereum, exploring allegations, U.S. government agencies attempt to silence whistleblower and monopolize crypto. Hashtag ETH gate. Wow, folks. Wow, wow, wow. In the complicated evolving field of cryptocurrency, Ethereum founder foundation, Ethereum, which is the second only to Bitcoin. And he goes on to say, oh, wow, there's a lot here. Second only to Bitcoin is embroiled in a dispute that involves allegations of multi-agency government conspiracy to prosecute a whistleblower from a fabricated crime to monopolize cryptocurrency on behalf of the government. Who said that about Sam Bankman Freed? Ethereum uses utility token ETH on a purportedly decentralized platform, ensuring that its network operates autonomously and transparently. The in, in uh, the internal decentralized structure is the defining aspect of cryptocurrency because only cryptocurrency networks that are sufficiently decentralized are not considered securities by the SEC. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission SEC governor uh, that would be Gary Gensler, and thus would not require regulations to regulations and disclosures. ETH are not currently considered securities because they are not tied to any central entry uh, in, or entity. Uh, profits or efforts. Now, one of the people first involved with Ethereum Foundation is Stephen Nairoff or Stephen Nayoff, a servant with over 40 patents in the AI and crypto sector. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say this right. Nairoff, N-E-R-A, Nairoff, claims he was the co- creator of Ethereum by providing initial capital and framework. The documents confirm that he had initially declined what today would be considered a few billion dollars in Ether. 
Neoff states that he was motivated to help the Ethereum project without initial compensation because he believed in the larger vision of the decentralized network that had the ability to help change the world for the greater good and to protect the project and people involved by eliminating any conflicts of interest. Now, when Nereoff dis, uh, disagreed about the internal structure of Ethereum, his Ethereum email was cut off. It was after that action that Nayoff claims things took a strange turn. He then uh, he he hired a consultant named Michael uh, Hadley or Haley, who used an alias Michael Peters to do background checks on him. Hadley at various times falsely claimed that claimed to be a former member of the United States military, a former government agent who had worked with the NSA or NSA Gov, he tagged them, and the FBI and the CIA. H. Lady made comments to persons in the cryptocurrency deals Nareoff was involved in what, uh, with that laid groundwork for the FBI to charge Nayoff with extortion. The FBI then obtained an arrest warrant but not a search warrant to search Nayoff's house and interrogate him about the players in the crypto world. FBI agents allegedly told Nayoff, we want dozens of convictions. Very uncharacteristically, after pursuing Nayoff in court, the government moved to dismiss its case against him, stating that it was unable to prove the charges in the indictment beyond a reasonable doubt. The events, These events had led people in the crypto community to believe that the government targeted Nayoff in attempts to capture the top figures in the crypto industry and monopolize cryptocurrency systems for the government. Stay tuned as OMG delves deeper into the unfolding story. This is about to get damn good, folks. Holy shit. Meet Stephen Nayoff. Smash that like button for Stephen us, folks. Stephen states he's one of the people who helped lay the groundwork for Ethereum. He's a savant with over 40 patents in the AI and crypto sectors. Ethereum is the world's second largest crypto product by market capitalization and was the first considered blockchain to support smart contract functionality. What are smart contracts? Think of them as smart code, logic that you can code into an application to do a certain thing. When Ethereum was founded about a decade ago, Stephen Nerioff was talking to one of the heads of the Ethereum Foundation and declined what would today be considered a few billion dollars in Ether, a grand total of one million Ether. This sum is calculated through contributor agreements, expense reimbursements, and other investments that Nerioff made at the time. Now, Stephen Nerioff states his motivation for helping this Ethereum project and not wanting to be paid was due to him believing in the larger vision of a decentralized network that had the ability to help change the world for the greater good. Nerioff also states that he wanted to eliminate any conflicts of interest to protect the project and the people involved. That's why he claimed he wasn't interested in the money. Now, Stephen Nerioff's cause has become something of an issue in the crypto community, so we decided to look into the documents back and forth between Nerioff and some of the people involved in the founding of Ethereum to evaluate how credible he is and whether there's a possibility of conspiracy afoot by the United States government targeting him based upon what he stands for. People in the crypto community believe this is about centralization versus decentralization, and they wanted to control this man and his product. More on that in a minute. Stephen Nerioff claims he paid for a lot of expenses in New York City in 2014 due to his home and resources being a hub for the people involved at the inception of Ethereum. In one of these conversations in this document with a guy named Stefan Tuol, chief communications officer, co-founder of Ethereum about expense reimbursement, there was a payment for a large office space and Stephen did not ask for reimbursement. Now, some in the crypto community accusing Stephen Nerioff of profiting off of this to the tune of billions, but the documents show Stephen didn't make any money at all. Stephen Nerioff also wrote a check as a guarantor on behalf of Ethereum because nobody was creditworthy except, apparently, for Stephen Nerioff. A guy named Anthony Diorio, another co-founder, would later vouch for Stephen's role, offering house, financial assistance, and more. It was around this time that a man named Joe Lubin, the chief operations officer for Ethereum, had a call with Stephen Nerioff where he was talking about how, with cryptocurrencies, there isn't a trail. Yeah, careful what you put in your emails because, I mean, those, you know, you don't know who's going to be keeping those and you don't know 
Exactly. And, and again, as we've discussed, uh, there's a tension between open a, between running a uh, an open, transparent organization and um, protecting ourselves. Uh, and so, may, maybe we agree to be open and transparent, um, except for everything from 90 days ago and, and uh, past, because it's all gone. It's sort of like the way cryptocurrencies were. You didn't know. Uh, you know, uh, there isn't uh, a trail if you don't want there to be. I mean, look, I mean, look. Uh, I... Now, why is that relevant? Well, it matters because some people think that that is not how cryptocurrencies are supposed to work, that things shouldn't be deleted, that there should be a trace. And there was kind of a fundamental disagreement there, sort of like a schism between these two founding people, one believing in radical transparency, the other believing in you can delete stuff after 90 days. I've had it with all my personal and private information being exposed and exploited by big tech and big government. So I'm joining my friend Eric Prince and I'm switching to my new unplugged phone. Protect your privacy, get your very own unplugged phone, go to unplugged.com slash OMG. That's unplugged.com slash OMG. Take your privacy back, unplugged.com slash OMG. Now, around the same exact time of that phone call, which was recorded, Joseph Lubin sent Stephen Naryoff an email about leadership discussions of employees versus volunteers. It appears Joseph Lubin was giving Stephen a heads up. They would take away his access to his Ethereum email, cutting Stephen Naryoff off from the Ethereum Foundation in about 2016. Stephen then followed up that his email was disconnected. He sent this email to the executive director of Ethereum Foundation saying his email was disconnected and explained how he structured the entire deal at Ethereum's conception. Then in January of 2018, a company called Consensus, a company founded by Joe Lubin's company and Stephen Naryoff, started to go on a public relations campaign against Stephen Naryoff with Evan Van Ness, an officer of Ethereum, claiming in an email newsletter that Stephen Naryoff is not a co-creator of Ethereum. We reached out to Van Ness for comment this week and received a response. In fact, Van Ness sent O'Keefe Media Group screenshots that Stephen Naryoff made to Democratic Senator from Rhode Island, Sheldon Whitehouse. Van Ness wrote to O'Keefe Media Group via X, quote, I don't know about you, but general experience with partisan left-wingers is that they are less than honest. Hmm. Van Ness is calling Stephen Naryoff a partisan left-winger. We find that odd, and we find that interesting given Naryoff is hanging around a bunch of right-wingers and we believe supports Donald Trump. Naryoff told us, and I'm paraphrasing, that he donated to Sheldon Whitehouse in order to develop crypto relationships in Rhode Island, though we can't confirm that to be true. Now let's go to June 2018. Bill Hinman, who at the time was the director of corporate finance at the Securities and Exchange Commission, was working on a new legal framework to decide which cryptocurrencies would be classified as securities. The Independent Securities and Exchange Commission is a government agency which enforces the law against market manipulation. In his now infamous speech in the crypto community, Hinman declared that Ether, Ethereum, was not a security, which was seen as a green light for the project and which some in the crypto community call a free pass. Money then started to pour into Ethereum as a result of this regulatory clarity. This is apparently the heart of the philosophical dispute between Stephen Naryoff and basically other people. If a network is sufficiently decentralized, it doesn't need disclosures that a security would require as it operates without a central authority controlling its operations. This decentralization is also what distinguishes utility tokens from securities as they are not tied to a central entity's profits or efforts. Ethereum's token Ether operates under the concept of a utility token. Stephen Naryoff claimed it was a digital product, meaning it has use, like a stamp. You have to use Ether in order to interact with the network, sending assets, building applications. But if you buy too much of it, some argue, it loses its status as a product and it becomes a security. But this is where people in the crypto community think there is a concerted effort for the powers that be to go after an individual who wanted to keep Ethereum decentralized for the greater good. They wanted to control him, so therefore they came after him. 
Now we get to the good part. Stephen Neryoff and his allies allege that Joe Lubin, the COO, appeared to want to buy Ethereum as much as he could without it becoming a security. And that's evidenced by this deceptively vague language in the terms of service that Joe Lubin is alleged to have written himself. The lawyers made Lubin change it back. Notice he used the word discouraged instead of prohibitive for speculation purposes. Neryoff then claims that Lubin tried to capture the network. Now, we've called and texted Joe Lubin for comment this week and received no response. We look forward to speaking with him, perhaps on our show on the inside. Vitalik Buterin from Ethereum Foundation put out a roadmap for next year called The Purge, which deletes all data that's older than one year. Bitcoin is immutable, and many believe this is fundamental to cryptocurrency. So the question remains, why delete history unless you're trying to hide something? Skeptics argue it goes against the core tenet of blockchain, again, this immutability aspect. Vitalik Buterin, who is a Canadian computer programmer, is dubbed as the founder of Ethereum. In 2021, Vitalik says that Stephen, well, he's problematic. Stephen is definitely a separate case. Like uh, Ethereum before about 2015, like there, there's definitely, you know, the founding team and the founding team had like a lot of characters that today I definitely don't approve of. And at the time I had no idea how to even like tell apart good people, good people from bad people. Um, and pretty much everyone seemed reasonable to me. And so like at the time I definitely didn't have the ability to kind of detect the problems in someone like Steven Neryoff. And then since then the Ethereum Foundation has gotten much better um, since then. We've also called and texted Vitalik and he did not respond by the time of this airing of the story. We look forward to talking to him on our show on the inside. We're waiting to hear from you. Given the success of the Ethereum ICO in May of 2017, an individual named Simon Yu asked Stephen to do an ICO for a company called Storm X worth about 2.25 billion Ethereum. Now, this new deal in November of 2017 was based upon a mutual misunderstanding in the first deal that they struck in July of that year. The government would later claim that Stephen Nuderoff extorted better terms, but emails showed that both sides had made mistakes in the first deal and it had to be redone. Then in September of 2019, the FBI obtained an arrest warrant, but not a search warrant. Stephen Nerioff alleges the FBI searched his house, went through boxes, looked through documents, Stephen alleges the FBI put him in a van and told him, you're not going to see your kids for decades. They wanted information on the who's who in the crypto world. Now, sitting on the floor of the van, Stephen was told by FBI agents, quote, we want dozens of convictions. In a declaration, March 30th of 2018, Simon at this company, Storm X, agrees to provide Stephen with 10,000 Ethereum secured against 70 million loyalty bonus tokens Steve was to receive in addition to the 2.25 billion he was entitled to. Steve had to surrender 350 million of the 700 million tokens he was due to receive under the loyalty program. Steve could repay the ether or have Storm X take the collateral. There were no set terms on repayment and the loan was interest free. To make things more nefarious and complicated, meet this man named Michael Halady who used the alias Michael Peters at various times falsely claimed to be a former member of the United States military, a former government agent who had worked for the NSA, the National Security Agency, the FBI, and the CIA. Haledi was hired by Stephen Neryoff to be a consultant to him to do background checks and other work regarding other people. This is all in court documents in this case. There you can see them. And there you see a photo of Michael Haledi. Haledi had sent a message to the folks at StormX saying that we're gonna sue you. Haledi also said he would, quote, destroy your community, which Stephen Neryoff team claims is just an ugly metaphor, perhaps a figure of speech, but was not exactly extortion. Nevertheless, in this document filed under seal, an FBI agent in the Eastern District of New York named Jordan R. Anderson said it was extortion, Neryoff stated, in sub and substance, 
that if John Doe and Jane Doe did not agree, then Naryoff would, among other things, sabotage the crowd sale, destroy the company. Also, this Haledi character, who had very bizarrely told others that he had been shot and killed people and taken down a head of state, he also said he was part of the Irish Republican Army. Very strange. It's a mystery who this man really is and why he involved himself with Stephen Naryoff in the first place. Naryoff claims this Haledi guy was hired to again assist him. But he became a sort of agent provocateur, the argument goes, to cause issues that the government could then use against Stephen Naryoff. In May of 2018 at the Hilton Hotel in Manhattan, Steve Haledi and this other person, Ari Yu, held a meeting that was surreptitiously recorded. In the transcript of that recording, Naryoff goes back and forth with this Peters Haledi guy in front of you, an executive at Storm X. Now in the transcript here it says, I did not call threatening to destroy, but I do recall Michael Haledi did. The FBI stated in their sworn statement that Naryoff affirmed that he knew of Michael Haledi's quote-unquote threat to destroy. And Michael Peters, aka Michael Haledi, said, yes, I did. Now, Naryoff says he never threatened anybody, Storm X, and the allegations against him weren't true. But the government did charge Stephen with a crime and named Haledi as his co-conspirator, based upon the text message that was sent by Haledi, apparently unbeknownst to Stephen, but on his behalf. Stephen was charged with extortion. The government said he forced them to negotiate the original deal. But the court eventually granted the government's motion to dismiss the case against Stephen, with the judge saying the government concedes that it is unable to prove the charges in the indictment beyond a reasonable doubt. So federal judge Margot K. Brody dismissed the indictment with prejudice. The government's goal, many in the crypto community now believe, was at any cost to capture a top figure in the crypto industry by putting pressure on this Stephen Nurioff guy to turn over evidence about other leaders in the crypto industry. Now, as an aside, the FBI raided my journalists' homes, and many believe that the true purpose behind that was to get access to my phone to know who I was talking to, the sources inside the government that I'm talking to, and to chill those people out, which is an egregious violation of my First Amendment rights. This might be a parallel we don't know. Stephen's case, many in the crypto community allege, highlights a multi-agency coordinated effort to prosecute a, what they would consider to be whistleblower, for a crime they fabricated. And we must ask ourselves why they would fabricate that crime. Could it be a conspiracy to monopolize crypto by the government on behalf of nefarious interests, as well as an unprecedented fraud of the public conducted by these same parties through crypto. An effort to control an individual who, while flawed, possesses certain key virtues to keep the network decentralized. Or is it just a guy who may have done something, perhaps while not illegal, perhaps strange or wrong on some level? And or maybe this is a guy who surrounded himself with the wrong people. Or maybe all of the above is true. We're not exactly sure. But we're digging into this further, and we look for sources with documents and evidence like the ones we've aired in this video, who can corroborate perhaps the next installment, and perhaps the more important question, which involves allegations of connections to the Chinese Communist Party and the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission's involvement in what some are calling regulatory capture. Stay tuned for the next edition of On the Inside. In today's Wow, wow, wow. Shogun in the chat says, Bitcoin's the next of all. Bitcoin was created by the same people that created ETH. Tell me you don't know anything about Bitcoin without telling me you don't know anything about Bitcoin. <laughs> wow. That's wild, folks. That is exactly why Bitcoin is Bitcoin and there is no second best, folks. Just ask Michael Saylor. <laughs> That's how we started off this conversation. Now, what's really, uh, really cool, I want to jump into this article with Jeff Booth. And uh, let me pull up the YouTube channel because I want to make sure I give him credit to uh, where this video came from. We're going to talk about the failure of the U.S. dollar and the and the collapse of the U.S. dollar and why it's this uh, centralized Ponzi scheme that's going to continue on. And there's no there's no way to stop it, I guess, because nobody would ever vote to stop it because voting to stop it means it's going to collapse all of civilization because everything's intertwined. So 
Um, until you completely remove yourself from the system, there's, there's no hope, right? So I'm going to work on over the next couple months, completely leaving this fiat world. Like right now, I tell you, I guess keep a couple of extra months of bills in my bank and everything else goes right into Bitcoin. But I'm pretty sure I can live 100% off a of bit Bitcoin standard. I just need to figure out how to use my Bitcoin via some type of debit card that allows me to pay my bills. I haven't figured that part out yet. So this is a video by Richard Vobs. It's on his YouTube channel, Richard V-O-B-E-S. I'm going to play about a five or 10 minute clip here. And this is uh, with Jeff Booth. He's probably one of the, I would say one of the most intellectual thinkers in the Bitcoin space. Uh, him, Greg Foss, they're doing amazing work. Michael Saylor, these are all legends in the industry. Uh, this video will really hit home. It'll really help you understand exactly how, how fucked we are in our fiat system, how screwed anybody is who saves in US dollars and why Bitcoin is the only hope. And uh, you should be doing everything you can to get yourself removed from this system 100% before it's too late and you don't have a chance. It's very, very kind of you to come and help me out and my audience, because I think a lot of my audience, some of them will, will obviously know it, and some people have been pushing me in this direction. But to the general public, I think it's something they've heard of possibly, but not really engaged with. And I'm hoping that you can help us through what appears to be quite alien in some ways. Yeah, uh, uh, happy to do my best on that. And 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 so so I, I would say first off, and and this is the one of the things I explored in my book. Um, the natural state of a free market is deflation. Right. So so, but say that a whole bunch of times, right? The natural state of a market is is deflation, and and why? Because we we try to solve problems and when we solve problems people use the service and they only use the service or product if it delivers more value than what was there before right that so, makes so, sense so so if we're solving problems and delivering more value and on, it only works if people use that then the natural state of the free market has to be must be deflationary um and then fr um from there um, prices fall to the marginal cost of production. And so you ask yourself, what is the marginal cost of production of this, this Zoom we're on? Zero. That's why it costs zero. Right. And, and, okay. and, 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 and now this, this, this can touch millions of people. This, so this one, uh, conversation could touch millions of people all over the world where it couldn't 20 years ago. We had to fly it. And so there are a whole bunch more cost embedded into the system. And this is just one example. Look at your phone and all the apps on your phone. And then ask yourself, what's the marginal cost of production of a line of code creating other lines of code where AI is taking us? Mm -hmm. And then ask yourself, what about the marginal cost of production of a line of code creating other lines of code connected to a robot that's going to do physical labor? And you can see... The natural state of a free market is exponentially deflationary. It gets better and better and better. And in that world, what that means, the rate of deflation today, I can't, you can't measure a counterfactual. So, but I would suspect we didn't live in the financial system we live in. The natural state of a market would be today at about negative 5% deflation. And so, so what, um, and that would be getting better and better through time or or more and more, um, um, say, productivity flowing to you in the form of lower prices every year, exponentially forever. That's what the world should look like. Hmm. And in that world, you would have uh, you would you would have everyone in the world getting richer at a faster rate as a productivity flowed to society. There is no monopoly in a free market. There can't be because anything that Rise, raises prices too high and as jobs follow the market all the entrepreneurs swarm to take advantage of that and they they bring prices down of the highest margin items so it constantly <laughs> moves to uh to to you in productivity in the world we live in it's a mirror image of that mm. because to when i wrote when i wrote the book there was uh 250 trillion dollars of uh, global debt um 250 trillion I know, uh, figure well, you can't can, imagine. You can't imagine. But 185 trillion of the 250 had come in the preceding two, uh, 20 years. And it had only increased uh, GDP, global GDP, by 46 trillion. 
So essentially one in four dollars, an extra four to one dollars of debt for GDP. And why was that happening? And why did I pro project that it would be exponential still and debt would today is so it's only four years later from my writing my book is now about four hundred trillion dollars of global debt. So why Presumably is, this this would never ever get paid back, would it? It, it would just so, continue. Yeah. So so now 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 go into that a little deeper. So so it, 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 if you paid if you paid back that debt globally at one dollar per second, the four hundred trillion, it would take twelve million eight hundred and seventy three thousand years to pay back. Bloody hell. <laughs> okay. So so now now you you can start to understand the problem we're in, right? Yeah. And and so. And, and you have to understand the problem you're in before you can understand the solution. Like what could build Bitcoin do? What does that mean? Mm. What is that? Because so the problem you're in is you're in this system and we are all measuring a system that must to stay solvent, raise prices. Right. And, and the faster technology moves one way, the faster it has to steal money the other way. So it's not, you're not measuring from zero inflation. You're measuring from negative five to whatever the inflation rate is. And that's, there is no democratic process to be able to vote for inflation or, or the capture of money. Right. This is so, it right here. So that means Listen. democracies have to break in that model because it's just theft. Mm. What, it, what it means is every single person in the world today is, is, has financial repression at a massive rate that is getting worse and worse. And that has to centralize and it has to make big monopoly companies and big media and WEF and big government bigger and bigger and bigger is they're now not in service to you. They're stealing from you. Right. So um, and, 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 and this is really important, really important. Yeah. And I'd love to, but, but really, so, so most people in the world are measuring that system from the system that's creating all the pain and yelling at different people within that system, making it stronger. Right. Okay. So to get out of this, which presumably everybody watching will be going, okay, well, we can't carry on with this because it's you know so detrimental to our lives and nobody wants to be in that much debt. And it seems clear that this will never get paid back um, and we just pass it on to the next generation, next generation and so on until one global company seems to own everything, uh, as does seem to be the prediction that or some of these globalists want. Then it's got to crash, hasn't it? And we've got to sort of... So, so, that's the, so this can go on for a lot longer and it goes on be, because of our behaviours. Everyone, including you, and this is hard, hard to say to people, hmm. But everything you're doing in the existing system is making it stronger. And right. you wouldn't vote and you wouldn't vote for somebody to allow that system to collapse. Right. Because if, if, if you allowed deflation from a credit based system, that's only credit, the whole, the whole 400 trillion gets reset It just counterparty risk. Everything fails. House prices, um, they, like they go almost to zero, um, because it, all banks fail. The entire system collapses. So there's no way any government would allow that to happen because there'd be riots on the street. And you'd, so what typically governments do in this is you create an enemy inside your country, the other side, mm. you capture more power, you capture more control, and then to stay elected because it's based on theft. And to stay elected, you have to create an enemy outside your borders. And then that's why, where the world goes to war. And this resets over and over throughout history. And the same thing resets because we could never live. Then here's a, you know, with gold, you know, with other uh, things because they're centralized, because they have to be centralized and you can't communicate at the speed of light on gold. It has to be centralized. They're subject to abuse. They get revalued, right? right? They get, uh, they get revalued rules change. And, and what and why, if you just a really simple reason throughout history, um, and, and, and why is because if you can convince society that 2% or 1% inflation is great when the market should yeah. be deflationary, then you get a free, you get to steal from everybody, all productivity of the, of the world <laughs> um, with doing nothing but 
printing a piece of paper. Mm. And, and, and so, so, so obviously if you could control that, if you could control money and money is super ordinate to laws, if you can control money, human nature says you will, somebody will. Right. Yeah. That and makes sense. It, it, and, and, and human nature says that you could go through 3000 years of human history and see the same thing <laughs> over and over and over again, repeating in the same thing because there, and this is where it starts to touch to Bitcoin and where everything I'm talking about right now, I actually tried to disprove when I looked at Bitcoin, because if there was something that was decentralized and secure, truly decentralized and secure the, for the first time in history and and there was always something before that through all of our history and all the history books that couldn't be decentralized and secure. Then the error code in all of our history books would be filled with, and the winners write the history books, would be filled with economics would look like a system that was always ended up being centralized because of that the power that it gains. And it just consolidates. Because there is only two parts past there is no free if there is no free market right without decentralization security and one path eventually leads, leads to total control <laughs> then and we never had something that could stop this then you could see why people would be really confused about something new like bitcoin that was so different than anything that was there before mm. and, and so you almost have to start that there and and um, and I'm going to say before I go deeper into Bitcoin, we'll talk a little bit more about this. But before I go deeper into Bitcoin, just you know, um, remember, I tried to disprove what I'm saying. And right. There's this there, there's this thing in Bitcoin that the people that aren't trying to scam you in Bitcoin will say will say, don't trust verify. And what that means, it's an open network. All of what I'm about to say. You can run your own node. You can. I audit the entire uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, technology every ten minutes with a node that costs me nothing, and so I'm one of the nodes. That, so, so all of the stuff that uh, I'm about to say about the decentralization and how this works and everything else is completely open for anybody to learn. And then ask yourself this: If you lived in a system that gained its control by stealing from you, what would it say? And all of the media, all of the giant, all of the government and all of everything else, the bigger they got, gain more control by stealing from you and taking it kind of not letting you see this fact that I'm talking about. What would it say about a system that gives it back? What would it say about a system that gives? What, it, it, what, 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 what would it say about a protocol like Bitcoin, an open monitoring mm. network protocol that gives that power back to you? And you could see, re, and, and then now you could see why it would be really confusing, and why it would you'd need to, to do op, you work with an open mind, because mm. the system you live in only remains solvent by debasing your currency. It has to lock you into that system. And it has there to it make you think there's another enemy within that system, right? And it has to take more of your freedoms away while it controls you. It has to. Mathematically, it has to. Otherwise, the thing fails. And so what would that system say and, and the people within that system, whether they know it or not, hmm. about a system that restores this balance to humanity and, and, and gives the power back to, you, to, to all people? It's pretty deep right there. You know, he, and I want to hit the point where he says, if you can convince the entire society that 2% inflation is great when the market should be deflationary, then you've pretty much granted or given yourself the ability to steal all of the economic value from the entire world by doing nothing but printing money. That's wild. To think about that, like they've convinced us that that a 2% inflation rate is okay. And so many people, even Trump got on board to championing the 2% inflation rate. Like that blows my mind. And that's going to be a really tough pill to swallow. Like to get the entire MAGA base to like 
call Trump out on that and be like, dude, you're fucking wrong, bro. What do you mean? 2% inflation. Now, Trump had us down to 0% inflation. I think it was actually negative 1% inflation at some point under Trump. Which it's like a, it's a double-edged sword because he's right. Like, do you guys understand that in order to fix the system, the system has to be completely burnt to the ground. And I just don't know if that's in the cards for America. Like, that's a lot of pain. That's a lot, a lot of pain. But under Trump, we were all doing good, right? Like, at least we were doing better. The economy was booming. I don't think you're paying off $34 trillion in debt anytime soon. I don't think any one administration is going to be able to do it. Not even close. But it has to be burnt to the ground. It has to be burnt to the ground. And I don't, I don't know if our country's ready for that. I actually know they're not ready for that. Sorry, I'm trying to find a better song. There we go. You know, think about that. You guys ready for that? Are you able to handle that much pain? Like you're talking about if the currency implodes in on itself. Every bank, every business. I don't think, I don't think Trump does too. I don't think Trump has the mental capacity anymore. Because like you need to be like top of your game. And I love Trump. I think he's the greatest and the only hope that our country has at restoring any any type of sanity to this. But I think that if if Vivek turns out to be a good dude, right? And he proves himself and he's actually a legit good dude, I think he could do it. I think you need somebody with that type of mental capacity and that sharpness in mind to really to to just burn it all to the ground. And it all and it all revolves around their ability to print money and it incentivizes war it incentivizes theft it incentivizes every everything that's wrong with society today all revolves around our money and trump's the biggest dollar bull there is so it's like in order to to break this system i don't know i don't know 25 percent of americans are already using bitcoin so that's a start and then you see places like El Salvador that did it in a four year period, but they went from like third world gang banger, most deadly country in the world, ran by gangs, cartel members, drug dealers, to somehow getting Bukele as president and building a military that you could trust. And now, like, and it seems like they were trying to, you know, trying to infiltrate it, trying to get gang members and, and gang bangers into that country. And one shot was fired. One person was killed. And Bukele sent an army of a thousand men to hunt them down. That's pretty boss. Considering how small that country is. You got an army of a thousand men hunting for you. You ain't gonna hide. It ain't gonna take them very long to find you. That's pretty boss what he did there. A thousand soldiers after a couple killers. And that sent, that sends a big message to anybody that thinks that they're gonna come into El Salvador and try to take their market back or try to take any territory back. And he sends a thousand soldiers after you just to hunt you down. And then think about that. You're not going into just any prison. You're going to prison with some of the like most hardcore gang bangers on the planet. Like these dudes were chopping people's heads off at age like 11, maybe even younger. And they're all in one prison together, nut to butt. I mean, that's some serious, serious shit there. That's the last place you'd probably want to go to prison. So like the, the economics incentives to like be a good person in El Salvador are, are extremely high. And the ec economic incentives to be a dirtbag, gangbanger, drug dealer, loser are, are not very good. And it seems like every single person in El Salvador knows what they just came from versus what they, uh, and all the opportunities they're gonna have. I mean, that El Salvador is gonna be, it's gonna be the next uh, Dubai. It'll be the it'll be the economic capital of the world, and there's no doubt about that. The problem is El Salvador doesn't have the power that the U.S. does, so he is free freer to do things like that than an American president would be. Well, yeah, they didn't have any choice over there either, and you're right about that. Yeah, hunting hunting people down like that, but at the same time, I think people in America are so sick. I think I think that we could we could deal with the dictator Trump for a period of time. Like our justice system is so rogue. Our FBI is so rogue. The CIA is out like committing war crimes all over the world. Like our CIA is running terrorist attacks through Telegram and paying people like it is wild. And the fact that we're not in a third world and like what's going on, if you guys missed my show on LFA TV today, 
Oh, that was a banger. That was a really good one. Probably one of the best shows, my favorite shows that I've ever done on LFA TV. If you want to see how much power these people actually have and how corrupt in the system is and broken the system is, swing over there and watch that show on LFA TV. I would highly suggest you don't let your kids go to school on April 8th, to say the least. It's a Monday too, so keep them home on Monday. Let them skip school that day. Take the day off work, call in sick. Enjoy that precious time that you have with your family because it could be the start, it could be the start of something really bad. I don't know how bad it's going to get, but I don't think people can survive many few more days without power. So yeah, that's right. If we have the majority though, do they, does it matter what they think? I don't really know. It's a, it's a tough place to be in. I wish there was more to, uh, we can jump over and take a look at the Bitcoin charts for a second. You guys think the market's crashed? You see crypto crash is trending over on Twitter. That James O'Keefe video is good. I wonder if East going to collapse now. <laughs> I really, I really wonder. I mean, I just can't. When stuff like that starts coming out and then Ethereum so as to be this decentralized blockchain, and now you hear it's working with the government, which we've said Solana was the same way the entire time. Maybe it wasn't. But then when you see people like Anatoly Yakovenko getting, uh, you know, getting indicted and some of these indictments, you're like, it's like the government doesn't want to help these people. The government wants to co-opt their blockchain. And you see like where Solana came from and how Sam Bankman Freed was all about Solana and the way that it onboarded the USDC and then USDC members from USDC are in Congress. And you're just like, man, this just seems so fucking wrong, man. These people like are acting like they're your best friends, but you know, they're sitting there rubbing shoulders with Wall Street and, 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 and our politicians. Like there's nothing good's going to come out of that. So we take a look at BTC on the, let's see if we're on the daily time frame. Let's jump over here on the daily and see what we got working. So RSI is still above that 50 level. Still bullish. I think our RSI is still sitting here on that uptrend, which I think is a great thing. I think we got plenty of room for a price to uh, still come down, which is weird to, weird to think how you go from like, such massive volume in these ETFs to, I don't know, just maybe it's just a sell-off pressure from Grayscale. I'm not sure. But I think that a lot of people are still going to be continuing to move their move, move their capital into Bitcoin. Like now is the time to do it. As we start coming down here and you got this pullback, I know a lot of people, including myself, we came all the way down to what was it around 61. And we bounced here and we went back up and I just was thinking to myself like, gosh, damn it, you idiot. Now I was an idiot because I bought here, I bought here, I bought here. And I bought here again at 65 and then I was out and then I ran out of money. My bots weren't making me enough money. So I ran back up again and we got back up here and I was just like, son of a bitch, man. As soon as it got up around 71 or 72, was it? Yeah, 71, almost 72 up here again. I was like, gosh, damn it. Like that's how long it took me to make more money to put back into the game. And I kind of sat there for a second and it came back down It got down to 69 again. I was like, okay, cool. I bought a little bit more at 69 Then I put another one at 65,400. I got another one down at 62,500 and then I got another one at 59,500. This time I'm going to try to ride it out. Um, I guess I don't really know what my fail safe is there that I guess if we get back up above and that's the hard part that I always that I always battle myself with, right? Let's just say I have $1,000 at 62 and I have $1,000 at 59,500. All right, so that means if it if I'm right here, I'm going to save myself 3% there by not buying at 65,500. I could buy at 65,300 right now, so a little bit less than that. So it's about 7% I'm gonna save myself, right? If I'm right, if I'm right here and price does come down lower than 64, 65, okay, cool. Smart play, I saved myself 3% and I saved myself 7%. I got that much more Bitcoin. So that means that I have to I have to put my money 100% back in the market before we get to 70,663 or $39. Which actually sounds pretty decent, right? That's not that bad of a bad of a play. But a lot of times it's not that easy, right? Like it's like, okay, do I put it back in at 68, 69? Maybe, maybe, maybe just 69 is the play then. I just say, screw it. I put it back in at 69,000. So if it starts to push back up and keeps going up, I'm just gonna say, okay, at 69,000, I'm gonna take that two extra thousand that I have down here waiting for these lower orders. I'm gonna put it in. And that would be about a about a six percent. So I probably want to do it at 5% maybe. So a little bit lower than that. Maybe 68,000. Yeah, 68,750, I guess would be the logical play. You know, a lot of times you're trying to wait for that that one extra percent. You know, price is at say like 29,000. You're like, oh, I'm going to wait till it gets to 28,000. And you're like, okay, well, that was like, you know, like a 1% move. 
but that means that you know if it goes the opposite way if it gets back above 31 well then you're at a big loss right and you normally end up paying more for an asset trying to wait to save yourself one percent you normally end up paying five percent more this this setup isn't here i guess is, isn't as bad but that's it you know if you're at 69 here or, or maybe you're over here and you're waiting at for it to come back down to 65 and you didn't buy it and then uh you know it shoots up at some point you're going okay if i don't buy and i had to hold back out for that i mean that's pretty risky watching bitcoin go from basically from 51 all the way up to 72 and it, in, in reality it ran all the way down from like 40 something from like 39 almost straight up to 79 like how many people were sitting here at this at this stop point here at 51 like oh, all right we're gonna come back and reconfirm down here we're gonna come and take out this liquidity up here i'm not gonna buy i'm gonna wait well you trying to wait for it to come back down uh let's see what would that have been yeah trying to save yourself six percent there <laughs> would have most likely led to you buying a top up here 46 percent higher <laughs> That's pretty wild. So hopefully you don't be that guy. I'm not going to be that guy this time. I just say fuck it. I just buy Bitcoin anytime I get the money. But this is literally the only time I put limit orders in on Bitcoin. And I got bots that trade. So I do have bots that are set up that are going to trade all the way down to like 49,000 or something like that. That's what they're already set up to do. But so worst case, my bots will buy me a bunch of Bitcoin. But and then my other bots that are trading shit coins that make me more Bitcoin will buy me more Bitcoin as well. So. I'm in a good spot, but what are you guys doing over here? Let's jump over to the live chat. Rockabilly, right on, right. I'm here to learn, man. All that time I was focused on Doge, man. I don't blame you, brother. I don't blame you. There was a, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how else to say it, but you know, everybody makes those mistakes and uh, now all you have to do is focus on Bitcoin, man. It's like the biggest stress relief. It's the biggest re stress reliever that you could ever have. Once you understand about Bitcoin, you start learning about Bitcoin, you realize there's no second best. As Michael Seller would say it, it makes your life so much easier and so much less stressful, right? Like you're holding on to Doge, you're holding on to ETH and that video by James O'Keefe drops, right? Maybe you thought one of, you're one of those people that, oh, Bitcoin ETF just got approved. The BlackRock ETH, ETF's gonna get approved next. You're sitting at ETH at around $4,000. Like, yeah, I'm gonna put in, you know, I'm gonna buy 12 coins of Ethereum. You're like, okay. And that's your counterparty risk right there. You have humans involved in the business model, which always leads to corruptibility. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Bought some Flux? Yeah, Flux is cool, man. Flux is cool. They're uh, they're a really nice product. I absolutely love the CEOs. I love the team. I uh, I'm just uh, yeah, I'm just all into Bitcoin this 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 cycle right now. You know, I went down the crypto project rabbit hole a long time ago. I absolutely love Dan. I think they're going to be very, very successful. I think the the decentralized nature of what they're doing to the blockchain space is is extremely good. And uh, I think they're going to be around for a really long time. I love their I love their wallets as well. XRP is a shit coin for sure. Sure is. Yep. I can get my bit to point zero two for now. There you go, Rockabilly. That's huge, man. I think point one Bitcoin will will be a large large sum of money like i think you can i don't i don't know there are a lot of people out there so you can retire on 0.1 bitcoin a lot of people are out there you know i bought this place cash and i didn't even really think about it you know financing this place i don't like the idea of financing it but at the same time i look, look at it and going yeah huh. take out a take out a, a second mortgage on there or a mortgage on the house refinance i don't even have to refinance i don't know what you call it when you own your house and you just want to borrow a loan against it take out a loan against your an asset a collateralized loan and then buy more bitcoin that sounds like a michael Saylor play i don't know if i'm really into that i'm not really into banks so yeah i probably won't do that but uh <laughs> yeah you never know point one will be a good a good spot to get to man that's the best thing about bitcoin you know it's just five bucks here ten bucks there did you see that interview I did Rockabilly with, with uh, Hernando Arce and the company called Strike? That's really neat. No fees. You're able to buy directly from your bank account without paying any fees. From, from, from what he sounded like, don't quote me on the no fee thing, but that's what it seemed like. It seems like they were converting his paycheck directly into Bitcoin. 
And I'm going to figure out how to get completely on the Bitcoin standard, like 100% living off Bitcoin. I don't know if you have to have a business that generates Bitcoin, though, for that to actually happen. And then you just convert all your all the fiat you mine right into Bitcoin. And I'm not fully under aware. I know you could do it with like something like FTX where you can live off like the FTX credit card. That was easy to put, you know, put crypto onto a uh, into your FTX account. They give you a, a debit card. And then when you bought, it would just cash out your crypto for, you know, whatever you purchased on the on the card. Oh, your house is only at 2.9. Yeah, that's cheap right now. You definitely can't refinance that for uh for a cheaper price. How do you get the equity out? What can you do with your with the equity? Can you take out a second loan at a higher rate for the equity? I don't, I don't know much about that kind of stuff, so. But yeah, that's what that's what Sailor was just saying in that video, right? Like, you know, you got a family business, you know, take out a loan from the business and buy Bitcoin. You know, do anything you can to buy Bitcoin because it's not getting any better. And as that currency continues to hyperinflate, and like Jeff just says there, like the more you start to learn about our money system, which is kind of cool. I, I actually am I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I've read about five books in the last week, I would say. Maybe, maybe not even I didn't finish all of them, but I've got hundreds and hundreds of pages into each one. And uh um it's like the more you learn about the money system, the more you start to really understand how broken it is, which is also like we've been in crypto. I've been in crypto since 2015 on and off, uh, back in again in 2020 and pretty much here from 2020 to late 2022. So pretty much almost 2023 took a year off, came back in 2024. And even, even being in the system for that long and not fully understanding like how, how bad the money system was, like it's, it's so hard to wrap your head around how the money system actually works. I guess is the easiest way to say it that it's so it's so complicated that like I, I don't really have to understand it to know that it's a complete Ponzi scheme, but uh, I'm trying to understand it now just for educational purposes to try to help educate more people on on those key things. But it's it's really complicated, and then you start to look at the economic incentives behind it and why people like that's what I keep asking people. Why do you think people are staying in that system? And I think that you just get to a point where you're so broke you can't get out of that system. And it forces you to play the game. And the game is just to, to survive. Like you're never getting ahead. Your bank accounts, your savings accounts never growing. You never feel like you can take a break from reality. You're always worried about getting fired from your job because you don't know what you'd do if you had to go back. I mean, a lot of people have been in the same job for 20 years. They don't even think they even know how to go apply for jobs. Like the last time that they applied for jobs, like applications were like, you know, you fill out a piece of paper at a at a business. You like walked into a place and you met the manager and you asked for an application and then you sat there and you filled it out and maybe even you got an interview on the spot. Like I was watching this video today on on what this guy has to do to get a job. He's like, you got to go get a job. You got to bring them a lead. So you have to go out and like hunt down a lead and you find a lead then you bring the lead to the business for free just to get your interview. And then you do then you do interview one. If you pass that, then you come to interview two and you pass that. Then you go to interview three and you pass that. And then sometimes they might even throw in a fifth interview just for the hell of it, just to tell you that, no, you're not getting the job. He's like, how the hell is this even legal? And I was like, damn, you know, it's gonna be rough if some of these boomers have to go out back into the real world and get a job, you know, it's gonna be, I just don't, and, and then you add in AI and how AI is gonna replace like 90% of us. You just think about like the robots, like we don't have to do all these jobs. And that means that one corporation is going to get comp more powerful and more powerful. That's what basically what Jeff was saying there, right? Like the system is so broken. The only way to, to keep the system going is, is to print more money. And the only way to keep people to shut up and allow it to happen is to take away their freedom, take away their ability to learn and understand how the system is worked. So if you don't know how the system works, it's kind of hard to take down a system that you don't know how it works, right? I think that's the plan is you just let big, big business get bigger, right? And then that lets big government keep growing and, and, and they grow together and they watch each other's back. And the person that continues to get screwed is you. And then I look at like the, like the jab and like how hard it was for people to really wrap their head around that that thing was bad. I mean, people were like fighting you. To fight for for big brother and big pharma 
And like big farmer, you can be trusted. And these people sell you a cure. And if you're cured, then you don't need them anymore. It's not a very good business model to think about. So it's like, how, 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 how hard is it going to be for everybody to wrap their head around that they were wrong about Bitcoin and that they have to start over? Because at some point, you know, I don't, I don't think at some point that Bitcoin gets to a million dollars and then it's like, oh, it's never going up anymore. I'm not going to buy it. I think you're still going to have those, those chances and those opportunities. And then maybe we start talking about Satoshis. So it starts becoming more of a, I can buy. Well, at that point, you won't be able to buy as many. Like right now you can buy, I think it's 1500 Satoshis for every dollar right now. Kimmy says, unless you're a carpenter, plumber, et cetera, you won't be working. Even automotive, you work on a line. I, yeah, she goes, my dad has, uh, has now become automated. I did. I used to program those robots that replaced your jet, your dad, Kimmy. There wasn't one person outside of the people that repaired the robots that I couldn't replace with a robot and teach a robot how to do your job. From stacking parts to putting parts in bins to moving bins to high lows to crane operators. I mean, I went, I remember at, at our work, we still had manual crane operators, guys that would walk around with a pendant and move the jobs from die to die to die. You know, the job, the dies are what uh, stamp the aluminum or, or steel car parts. There's these giant things, probably like the half the size of, they're probably like a, a single wide trailer. They're massive top and bottom pieces. So they have them all and basically in these rows and then the crane operator call somebody will call on the line for like job seven the crane operator will go over to this big rows of all these dies and he'll find job seven he'll pick it up bring it over a lot of times he takes whatever die was off the previous uh job set job 15 was running takes 15 off puts 15 back where it goes grabs job seven and puts it over there and sets it up for the next job that's going to go in and we have uh guys that do that one by one by one and then i went out to ford i mean there's like every shift has like four or five of these crane operators, maybe even 10, depending if you count both of our plants that were kind of connected to each other. And then I went to Ford and they have twice as many machines in one guy. All the guy has to do is loop the cables on. So he wants job five and he presses a, he presses the button five and the crane automatically drives itself, automatically centers itself down, lowers itself all the way down. And all he does is put the cables on it and he presses a button and the thing picks itself up and moves it back over travels all the way across the plant with it all automated and then the guys at the end of the line when they're stacking parts right so lines like picture the parts coming down the press line everybody's down there stacking them stacking them in a bin at our factory we have like shelves behind them so after they get like 10 or 15 in they turn around put them in the bin count another 15 right put them in all day that's what they do and then uh you know when a bin gets full the bin can hold a couple hundred uh, they'll re run over the machine, print a, print a label, put the label on it, smack the label on it. And then the high low driver, once he sees the label, will come over, take it off, take it away, put a new bin on there. Right. And he's driving the, you know, maybe he'll stack like 10 bins high and then he'll take all 10 bins back to the, you know, shipping and receiving. Well, at Ford, they have these floating, like floating football fields, man. They're these giant platforms that are already pre-stacked with bins. They just have one high low driver that's basically loading these uh, I guess we call them football fields, like these basically things that just are flat level and they hold a bunch of parts and they just, you know, drive themselves all automated. These things don't. So just one by one and then takes it off. And so it's just one high low driver, one line operator, one crane driver running a, a plant that I mean, Ford is freaking massive. I mean, they got a lot of people there. They got a lot more than I'm just talking about there. But I mean, the process was really simplified and versus our versus our plant. And then like we did, we did work for Tesla and Tesla got into the automotive industry, right? And the automotive industry reminds you of like a government industry. Like it doesn't move fast. They're used to doing things the old way. Uh, you know, if something's not right, you get about 50 guys in a room and they group think and they try to how to solve the problem. And it's never the best idea that wins. It's whosever idea is going to make the boss look the best. That idea normally wins, right? So Elon gets into the game. And our bosses are used. We, we took some Tesla work because they were just pumping out so many cars. Elon's like the contracts with Tesla, like we wanted them. And every company that like Tesla started by outsourcing almost everything. And then one by one, like Elon was just like, well, fuck you. We'll make it ourselves. And he just started pulling all of his work back. So it came to a point where 
I forget what he was doing, but he was, he was pissing off our bosses and like somebody in the, in the call, like he was on a conference call one day. And I remember this one specifically, they, uh, they didn't know Elon was on there. Elon was at the, in the Tesla's conference call and Elon was sitting in the back of the room and, uh, Elon wanted some, some parts made. And it just like, wasn't mathematically possible to get them done in the quantity that he wanted in the amount of time that he wanted them. And uh, somebody from my company, Thai Summit, stood up and like said something like, hey, uh, well, just to, just to let you know, that's like, that's not mathematically possible. He's like, we just, there's just no way we'd have to work like 24 hours a day, you know, to get that done in an X amount of time and blah, 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 blah. And Elon goes, who was that? And, uh, you know, and everybody like in the, in the, in the conference room, like it's kind of like froze. And we're like, oh shit, didn't know Elon was here. And Elon goes, who just said that? Uh, you know, John from Thai Summit. And he goes, listen here, John. He's like, I'm going to tell you that you're going to get it done and you're going to get it done on time or we're going to find somebody that'll get it done and I'll replace you. And everybody's just like, oh, and that's how Elon ran it. And he ran it with an iron fist and sure as shit he did. That was the last job that we did for Tesla. And he took all of his jobs back from us, which we were at that point. They were like, listen, we're used to doing it the old way and Elon's never going to make it. Tesla's never going to be successful. There's nobody he's going to put up with all that or anybody's going to put up with his shit. And he just went and started building bigger factories and automating everything. And now Tesla was, you know, probably one of the biggest contracts that we ever lost and probably the, the biggest L that that company ever took outside of getting sued or GM, GM fucked him over pretty bad. So last bull run or not last bull run, last uh, economic collapse in 08, when GM went bankrupt, like they were, they were getting work done by all these independent companies. Like GM doesn't make the entire, their entire car. Like we'll make roofs for them. We'll make doors. We'll make fenders. We'll make anything that, that we want that just they don't have the capacity to make or just maybe it's just not cost effective because they're a union and it's cheaper just to outsource the work so uh they we owe gm a lot of money when they filed for bankruptcy they didn't have to pay any of that money back so we took a the company took a couple million dollar l which i think is what we're going to see now I, I just you're watching people lose their cars car payments now are like 1700 dollars a month like how are people going to be able to afford to live they're just not gen z doesn't want to work anymore nobody wants to go work as a slave like it was the noble thing back when, you know, our parents were kids to go to work, go work hard. You can, you know, make money because you actually could. If you just worked hard and you worked your ass off, you could buy yourself a car. You could buy yourself a house. People were buying houses at 20 years old and actually being able to afford to buy them. Because even when you were a fuck up, the amount of money you made allowed you to be a fuck up. And like you were able to grow into being an adult by making mistakes, but those mistakes didn't bury you. And now it's like, shit, you lose your job for a week. You're, you're going to miss your mortgage. You're going to be behind on your car payment. Both parents have to work two jobs just to keep the roof over their head. You can't pay attention to what your kids are doing because you're working 24 seven. I just don't see how much longer society is going to put up with it. We don't take a stand now. We don't have anything to stand for. So God bless you guys. I'm going to quit yapping. It's been a long night. I've been going since, uh, I don't know, our first stream was at 10 this morning. So we're going to have a great show tomorrow. Brian D. Mintz coming on. He's uh, one of the co-founders of the Orange Pill app, and he's also a Bitcoin author was one of the best Bitcoin selling books or best selling books wrote about Bitcoin. So if you guys are uh, want to learn a little bit more about Bitcoin, you guys enjoy the show. Come join us tomorrow morning. It's going to be a good show. God bless you guys. Hopefully you guys have a safe night. Get out there and stack some Bitcoin, guys. Love you guys. See you guys tomorrow. Run.